Hello everyone. In previous lecture, I promised you something about differential forms and Riemann's theorem, but I actually have one more thing to say about the topology of plane curves. So there's something computable about constructing loops inside of plane curves, and uh, this will play a role in representing the curves in some sort of transcendental way. So first, let SG be some real surface of genus G. So this G means that there are these G donut holes. So there's this first homology of SG that I will remind you just a second. So this is an abelian group and it has two G generators. And I will write generators like this. So alpha 1 through alpha G and beta 1 through beta G. So what's important is that this is a free abelian group of rank 2G. This is the group of loops inside of SG, but the uh, loops do not have base points and uh, we can move them freely by boundaries of little disks if you want. So this, so this is in fact isomorphic to the first fundamental group, but abelianized. So if you prefer to think with the fundamental group. No matter, what I'm saying is there are these circles, these loops, which I will call alpha 1 through alpha g. So these are these alpha ones, and these other circles, beta 1 through beta g. So these are these loops. So if we're being very precise, these are of course homology classes of these loops, but we don't need to be so pedantic here. Now as I mentioned, when we have a curve that's of genus g, then the underlying surface looks like this. So it will have these 2G loops inside of it. And this isomorphism means that, so whenever you give me a loop inside of SG, then I can deform it basically onto this skeleton into the union of these blue and green things. And the loop you've given me will traverse each of these loops uh, some number of times, an integer number of times. And that will be the representation in this uh, basis. The importance of this H1 will become clear later on. But basically, most of the surface is useless. The most valuable part is, are these loops, together with information coming from differential forms, which we will talk later on. The following fact should help you appreciate the value of these loops. So if you remove a single point from SG, then SG will contract to a one-dimensional skeleton formed by the union of these loops. So that's called a bouquet of circles. So you have a point, you have a bunch of circles, 2G of them, that's a bouquet of circles. And homologous to means it sort of can be contracted to. So it really give, suffices to give the proof in the case of genus 1, and you'll see how it goes in the rest. So we use our plane models. Remember, we use these polygons. So the interior here was my torus. The opposite edges are identified. So what I'm saying is that you remove a single point and when you remove this point I'm able to do a transformation that I couldn't do before which is to push everything to the boundary. So by a continuous deformation, I can map these points to the boundary. So if there was a point in the middle, then in the end, this would rip my surface apart. But when the sur this point is missing, I can take this as the center of my uh, action of pushing things to the boundary. So this thing becomes homologous to just this boundary. And this, here in the skeleton, look like this. So these were my generators alpha 1 and beta 1. Now for arbitrary g you just use the polygon with 4g sides. And it's clear that the same kind of puncturing will make your service homologous to its boundary and after the identifications you'll be left with 2G 
circles. So now let's get back to an algebraic curve. So now C is a curve defined by F. So we we built in the definition of smoothness into our curve. So I take a smooth curve defined by the polynomial F and I would like a representation of the loops inside the Riemann surface associated to C. So we would like to be able to compute such a thing. So the first trick is to choose a point not inside of C and without loss of generality I'm going to take P to be a point into infinity and this one. So obviously P2 is symmetric so I can send any point to this coordinate and you don't have to. So what I'm about to do can be done with any point. It's just uh, this makes the notation simpler. And then we have a projection So this is a projection map from the point P to P1. So if you want to see what's going on here, so in particular if P wasn't this point, P2 comes from projectivizing C3, and P really is just a line. So if I choose a lift, maybe P tilde inside of C3, then there's a line corresponding to P. So I have this inclusion, and then I can form the quotient. Which of course is just C2. And this C3 gives me P2 and that C2 gives me P1. So the projection map is simply this quotient map from linear algebra but after you projectivize. Now we don't have to be so fancy when we're dealing with this point P. There's a very simple way to represent this projection map. So let's continuing with our assumption that P is that point. I can write my projection map simply ascending x, y, z to x, z. And as you can see, precisely the point 0, 1, 0 maps to 0, 0, so it's not well defined at that point, since 0, 0 is not the point in P1. And on the affine chart, we can make this a little bit clearer. So on the affine chart, where the z coordinate is invertible, I can set z equals 1, so I have x, y coordinates. This will go to a1, and I will just get x. So that if I were to plot at least the real part of this picture, I really, I really am doing a vertical projection. And I can view the x-axis as to the locus that I'm projecting to. I don't have to consider this as something abstract, so I can choose a lift. I can always lift this quotient into the ambience space that I'm projectivizing and it's convenient to yeah, choose the x-axis as my lift here. Okay, so that I can draw my pictures, let's just specialize to this affine chart. So I will write, so I will just plug in 1 into my f and let's say work with c0. This will be the 0 set of cg, set of a2, which I'm identifying with one of these affine charts in P2 where Z is invertible. So this will be just a Zariski open subset of C. Now I have C0 in A2 and I can go to A1. So the situation here is nicer because A1 is already a complex curve. It's not projective but it's it's essentially P1. And so here, the complex points gives me this complex plane. C0, I don't know what that is, but what I do know, and we will see this in just a second, is that generically it's going to be a default cover of this sheet. And I need to understand how I'm supposed to glue the copies of this sheet to form C0. Now here, let's say D is the degree of F and G. So what makes this construction interesting is that this is typically a ramified cover. That means, in general, if you were to take a small disk, I take a small disk, then there should be D copies of the, this small disk here. But every now and then there will be a special point, D1, 
is we call ramification points so that when I take a circle around a disk around this point we will have fewer than d copies maybe some disks still that map diffeomorphically by this projection but also sometimes a disk that's mapped by z goes to z squared z a complex coordinate here so it will become a double cover or a triple, triple cover sometimes we draw this as a spiral like this So that will be a ramification point. Maybe you remember, in one of our first lectures, we tried this strategy to figure out the shape of the complex circle. So when the equation was x squared plus y squared equals one. And that was rather involved. But our goal now is to understand the loops inside of C0. And that's a one dimensional object. So it's going to be simpler. So let's draw this shape once again. It's getting messier here. And let's think about how this ramification is working. Now, if I'm projecting from A2, above each point, I have a line. But above each line, if I try to find well, how this line intersects C0, let's say this is X0, and I'm trying to figure out the curve above this, this line or the intersection of the curve with this line, then I'm trying to solve for the zero locus of X0, Y1. So here, Y is the indeterminate, x0 is fixed and 1 is fixed. So I'm trying to solve a univariate polynomial. So that there will be d roots here. And as this x0 moves, my line moves. And of course my roots move. And as you go from x0 to x1, you can, if you avoid, avoid the ramification points, you can uniquely lift each of these paths on your curve. Let's can be non-trivial how these roots are permuted. When you try to make sense of it, the most interesting statement is that if you fix your roots above x0 and you go to x0 in along different loops. So let's say I go like this, this is one of my loops, and I will have a permutation of these roots as I move along my curve and then come back. So if I were to start with this root and then follow along, I might find myself with another root. This is the monodromy action. And this will give me a permutation of all the roots here. If I start with this root, I'll find myself with another root. Another path might induce another permutation. But the key point here is that you get an interesting permutation only if you go around ramification points. So if there was a ramification point here, then you can figure out the permutation you get by studying only that single ramification. Now, I will not tell you exactly how to so figure out this monodromy, except we've reduced the problem to essentially studying univariate polynomials. So you would have to study this univariate polynomial above, the, above this ramification. It will have a double root at least. But what I will tell you is how to compute the ramification points. Because if you have all the ramification points, then you just have to construct loops around these ramification points and understand how the ramification points sort of permute loops around them. And then by putting together those, well, the lifts of those loops upstairs, you can construct all loops inside of C0. So the second part, sometimes called the monogamy action around a ramification point. So what I will do right now is to explain how we can compute ramification points. And then I will show you an example where people have coded all of these things in Sage so that you really do get precisely a shape like this and loops around these ramifications. Well, a picture will be enough. So let's say I have a curve like this. Of course, I can only plot the caricature of a curve or the real points of a curve if you want. Let's say this is my C0. Remember that I'm projecting vertically. And these two points on the curve will land in this point on the x-axis. Well, if you do it right, of course, the degree is constant. So if you work over the complex numbers, the degree of your projection is constant. But you have to count what multiplicities. So here, the moment you hit 
point on the curve with a vertical tangent, then the multiplicity of this point must be counted twice. And what's happening is, so you can already see it here, so this complex disk or this real line in this picture is diffeomorphic to these neighborhoods, but you can construct no such diffeomorphism around the ramification point. So here the map around this point from a coordinate around this point is like a squaring map. It doesn't have a local inverse. Anyway, so our goal is then to find all points with vertical tangents. All right, a bug just changed my colors, but it's all right. Here at some point, we talked about this before, that I can construct the normal direction by using the nabla of my defining equation. So the partial derivatives of g, so this would be partial x of g and partial y of g. And at a point with a vertical tangent, my normal direction will be horizontal. So I must have no y component to my normal direction. So the y derivative of g vanishes. So if I would like to find all points where I have a vertical tangent, I just need to solve for g and the y derivative of g. So it's the zero locus, g partial y of g. Well now we can solve such polynomial systems. I have two equations and two parameters. I can find these coordinates. So we've been studying this in the past lectures. Once I find points with vertical tangents, and their x-coordinates will be my ramification points on the x-axis. Okay, now, let's see this in action using a computer. So we will find not only the ramification points, but also loops around those ramification points, and we can even ask for a homology basis. All right, so I'm going to use the package Riemann service in Sage Math. So you can read more about it in the documentation. So this was written by Zotin, Roin, and Saisley. And all it can do many things, some of them I will show you in the next lectures. But today we're talking about finding these loops, this homology basis. So they explain to you the syntax for calling the package remount surface. And once you import it and you write down an affine polynomial in two variables. So this will be the equation defining R curve. So I called it G, maybe I call it G. I just took this from their documentation. So it creates an object called Riemann surface. One thing it can do is to plot a Voronoi diagram. So this is a Voronoi diagram around the ramification point. So think of this as the x-axis. So that's a complex plane. So this is a plane. And in these gaps are my nine ramification points. So they're trying to stay away from the ramification points to ease certain computations. And these are loops then around those ramification points. So all of these are certain loops. And I can chain these loops one after another. And I need to lift these loops into my Riemann surface, into my curve. So my curve is degree four. So each of these line segments will lift into four line segments in my curve. So I have four copies of this graph upstairs, but the way the edges of these graphs are identified, so the, the vertices are identified with one another, are non-trivial. So that if you go around the ramification locus once, you do not get a circle, but you get a path with open ends. So you might have to go around this loop twice, so that you get a closed loop upstairs. And here, when you ask for the homology basis of S, they will give you a basis. So this is the first basis. They tell you start at vertex number 10 and use the zero lift. So they have four lifts, so numbered 0, 1, 2, 3. Then go to the ninth vertex and the seventh one and so on. From 8, you switch to the sixth vertex, but the second lift. So it has an internal labeling. So 10, 9, 7, 8, 6. It's 10, 9, 7, 8, 6. So it's going along this edge so far. If you follow through, it will go around and that will give one loop. What I want to show you here is that we indeed have nine ramification points so that we can check with what we have done. For example, I construct this ideal with f and the derivative of f with respect to y. I change to lex ordering and here the lexicographic Grubner basis really does have this univariate polynomial in y. That's of degree nine, so I have nine ramification points. This gives me the projection to the y-axis. To get the x-axis, I need to 
change the order of my legs. So I don't know how to do this in Sage, so I just shifted the order of the variables like this. Now B is my new B is X, so this gives me the ramification points and the X axis. And at least we get a match here. This is the nine, there are nine chambers in this Voronoi diagram. All right, that concludes the presentation for today. See you in the next lecture.